Okay, you know, I still see people coming in, but maybe this is a, a good time to just go through a little introduction. So welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you and your families are all in good health and safety, uh, especially for anyone joining us today from the East Coast. Um, glad you'd all make it. Thank you so much. Now, before we begin, uh, we just have a couple of quick points to go through. We will be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit questions in the text box uh, on your webinar control panel. We try to get to as many as possible within the hour, uh, but if we don't get to your question uh, during the webinar, we promise to follow up via email to make sure your questions are all answered. Uh, all questions will be addressed anonymously. Um, quick disclaimer, all information discussed in this webinar is for educational purposes only. It should not be applied directly to the administration of any particular file or claim. This webinar is being recorded uh, and will be posted on our website, LinkedIn, and YouTube pages. So please uh, feel free to pass them along to your colleagues. Use them in team meetings if you wish. We'll be sending everyone a completion certificate following the webinar. We will try to get those out to you next week. Um, it is a somewhat uh, manual task, and we are, uh, we're a pretty big group today, but we'll do our best. Uh, with regards to uh, continuing education credits, this webinar is accredited in Manitoba and British Columbia, and we're just uh, waiting to hear back from Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, we don't anticipate any issues, so if you're from one of those provinces, don't worry. It's just a bit of a waiting game. Um, now, at the end of the webinar, when you close the window, you will be prompted to answer a few quick questions. We, we always uh, love to get everyone's feedback about the speaker's content uh, and any any other feedback you may have, uh, and that brings me to my last point. Uh, a month from now, we're gonna be hosting our sixth annual national tour. This year's focus will be on equipment failures and component malfunctions. Uh, and as always, we have a really wonderful group of presenters. Uh, so in that survey at the end of the webinar, you're going to be asked if you'd like to sign up for the national tour and you just have to select yes, and you'll be automatically signed up. It's, it's again, it's gonna be, it's a one day, it's a multi-session, webinar um i believe it's five sessions this time and you can just participate in whichever ones you like and we'll be tracking it automatically so uh, you don't have to worry about uh selecting which ones you want to attend um oh sorry uh final final point uh during the webinar if you're experiencing any technical difficulties you can email our team questions at webinar at origin dash and dash cause dot com uh or you could just simply use the question box in the control panel uh okay Let's get started. Uh, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind just uh, advancing the slide. So today we are doing uh, do's and don'ts of handling a new fire and explosion claim. Our speaker today is Ryan Norton. Uh, Ryan is a certified fire and explosion investigator. He's also a lieutenant with the Lumsden Fire Department in Saskatchewan. Uh, he's a wildland fire investigator. He's conducted over 200 fire investigations with 10 years of experience, and he has assisted in multiple uh, major crime investigations with the RCMP. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Ryan. So yeah, please take us away. Good morning, folks. I'm super happy you could all join today. Uh, today, we're gonna be briefly looking at the investigation process that um, fire investigators follow. As well, we'll be looking at a few do's and don'ts of handling a new claim um, from the perspective of a forensic expert, and then go through a few hypothetical situations and some questions that you might want to ask yourself um, with those, those situations. Lots of this I'm sure you already know, but um, hopefully we can help provide some new insights and, and reasoning into why we ask that things are done a certain way. Um, to start off, I just want to talk a little bit about the investigation process that we follow as it's outlined in the NFPA uh, 921, which is the guide for fire and explosion investigators. Um, the first thing, as you might guess, uh, we will receive the assignment and are told what our role will be. For example, are we expected to determine the origin, cause and responsibility of a fire or another loss, um, produce a report, prepare for criminal or civil litigation. Uh, once the assignment has been received and expectations are set, uh, the investigator will then begin gathering as much information from the client and the insured as possible so that they can plan the investigation. 
Um, Pre-planning at this stage can greatly increase the efficiency and chances for a successful investigation. Um, looking at what tools, equipment, and personnel will be needed can make the initial scene investigation, as well as any subsequent examinations, go more smoothly. Um, <clears throat> next is uh, conducting the actual investigation. Um, I'm not going to go too in depth on this section uh, since there's so many variables and possible directions that the investigation could go. It might be a simple one trip scene examination. It might include seizing evidence or using the knowledge from one of uh, engineers or a specialist. It could include a preliminary investigation followed by a multi-party examination. Next, uh, I guess in, conjun in conjunction with a scene investigation, it may be necessary to collect and preserve evidence. Um, during this part of the process, valuable physical evidence should be recognized, documented, properly collected and preserved for further testing or for courtroom uh, presentation. Next, your investigator will need to analyze the data that's been collected uh, using the principles of the scientific method. Depending on the scope of one's assignment, hypotheses should be developed and tested explaining some or, some or all of the following, the origin of the fire, the ignition sequence, how the fire spread, fire cause or cause of the damage, and the responsibility of the incident. Once all of that data has been analyzed, your investigator will begin working on conclusions. This is the final hypothesis drawn as a result of testing all of the hypotheses. Um, the conclusion they come up with may include a level of certainty. The level of certainty describes how strongly someone believes in the conclusion. The two levels of certainty most commonly used are probable which means it's more likely true than not. The likelihood of the hypothesis is greater than 50% and possible. This means that it's feasible, but it can't be declared probable. If there are two or more hypotheses that are equally likely, then the level of certainty must be possible. In the past, the 921 had broken fire causes down into four different classes, accidental, natural, incendiary, and undetermined. Changes in the classification have made it that were made in the latest version of the 921 and uh, fires are no longer classified in this way. So now while fires can still be deemed undetermined, the other causes are simply a breakdown of the events that led to the fire, including the ignition source and first fuel ignited and the circumstances that led to the fire. Now we want to discuss a few do's and don'ts for responding to um, structure and vehicle fires. The first do we'd like to discuss is to always give specific and explicit instructions to contractors. Now, this is kind of, I guess, um, directed towards the adjusters here in our audience, as well as any contractors who might be here to make sure that they get the right information. Things you want to keep in mind when giving the instructions are board up uh, or fence up the scene, secure debris piles by covering them with tarps, and to make sure you preserve the electrical panel. One of the first things we want to do is make sure that our scene is boarded up and secure. Um, the security of our fire scenes is important not only for us to go in and do our work, but also for any follow-up work that may be done by adjusters or other personnel. Unauthorized access into the scene could be problematic, not just a random person gaining access, but also the homeowner or the insured gaining access back into that fire scene. We don't want them entering into that fire scene for one, their safety, but especially if they haven't been interviewed, since it may affect the interview, having them look at the fire scene post-fire before we can get a statement, it, it could affect how they remember the events that took place. Um, leaving the fire scene unsecured could cause problems for our investigation, and it could cause problems later on down the road with regards to any issues or hypotheses that are developed as a result of the investigation. Contrary to popular belief, that yellow barrier tape on there doesn't really keep people from entering the fire scene. Watching people around fire scenes over the years, you'd think it says, welcome, come on in, rather than caution or do not enter. It's best to be secure, and it's best to make sure that the access to that scene is totally restricted. Next, you want to make sure to secure the debris piles by covering them with tarps. One issue you come across is piles of debris that end up outside the house. 
Often fire services that attend the fire have overhauled the scene and the debris is shoveled out and ends up on the front lawn or the back lawn or on the driveway. And unfortunately, we've attended many fire scenes where that debris was very quickly cleaned up by contractors or restoration crews. Only after examining the fire scene and contacting the contractors do you realize that the evidence has not only been removed from the scene, but it's been disposed of. Just as important as keeping the interior of that scene secure is to keep the items that may be on the exterior of that scene secure. Covering the debris on the outside with tarps allows that evidence to out there to be protected and secured. It also allows it to be examined on site and in place as best as possible. You will also wanna be very clear to contractors or restoration companies to not alter the electrical panel. The next item of concern is the electrical distribution panel. It seems that this is a common issue where after a fire scene, one of the first things done is the electrician goes in, removes the panel and puts in a temporary one. The original panel that was in this house had a lot of information. It was evidence. The removal and disposal of that panel, of that panel and the installation of a temporary panel or a new panel with temporary breakers has now removed any evidence that we may need. There's no way the system can be checked and there's no way we could evaluate the electrical system based on the panel. It's very important that these items be protected. So in giving some instructions as part of the fires, as, as part of the scene security of this home, we need to make sure that the electrical panel is left in place and the electrical system within the house is not altered prior to the scene examination. Electrical breakers are witnesses at the scene that can help clarify information. So the best bet is to take photos of the electrical panel as soon as possible. It captures a moment in time as to the status and progression of the fire, and it provides valuable information that we can use to help sort and rearrange all the bits and pieces of the puzzle to create an overall picture. Also, as you can see just by the general style and arrangement, the panel in this photo is a relatively new installation. However, in some older houses, you can tell if there has been any renovations or if there are different styles of wiring, such as aluminum or knob and tube, which can be used to, which can be helpful in an investigation. Again, taking photos of the electrical panel provides us with key elements. Not only do they tell us the status of the breakers, whether they're on or off or tripped, whether they're involved in the fire, but it also gives us the opportunity to look and see what style of breaker they are or whether they are the appropriate size and rating for that particular circuit. If the power does need to be shut off, flip off the main electrical supply, not individual switches. Leave them in their post-fire state. That's the best way to stay safe and it still provides us with the evidence that we need. This is an example of an electrical panel that was cut out of a basement after a fire, then thrown in the garbage before we had a chance to even look at it. No photos were taken of it prior to it being moved, and in the process of it being cut out and removed from the scene, a lot of the breakers had disintegrated. So that information is now completely lost. The second do on our list today is to secure evidence and make sure that it's secured appropriately. Anything removed from a fire scene that needs to be examined is evidence. Treat it with the importance that it deserves. Treat it as if it could end up in court. If evidence has to be removed from the scene prior to the arrival of an investigator, it's important to make sure that it's logged and the custody of it is outlined. If items are removed and taken to another facility for storage, make sure you include instructions on how you want it handled. You want to be clear on what this evidence is, what it is, what is to be done with it, how it's to be moved, how it's to be packaged, as well as stored. Another thing to consider is to make sure that this evidence can be stored long term in case this file takes years to conclude. This is the information that you want to include with your chain of custody. Date and location of the incident, description of the sample or part, the manufacturer's name, model and or serial number if it's available. Have, you want to have all the attending parties review and sign the document, attach a photograph if possible, and you will also want to retain a copy for your records. One of our investigators was sent to a contractor's facility so they could examine a refrigerator that was removed from a significant fire. There were concerns that this refrigerator was the cause of the fire 
and the examination of this appliance was going to be very important in this case going forward. On arrival at the contractors, he was directed to a snowbank. The refrigerator was left outside, not only unprotected, but placed in an area where snow was piled as a result of the plowing of their lot. After the melting of the snowbank, this is what was left. This is the evidence that was left from a major loss that was required to be examined. It is quite possible that this evidence could be severely damaged and now is of no useful purpose, all because it was stored inappropriately. So make sure anything that is removed from any facility is treated as evidence. Make sure it is stored appropriately and make sure it is done in a timely manner. Try not to do this. This is a photo of important evidence that was found at a fire scene by a contractor. Bagging up evidence and leaving it attached to a front door unsecured and with no photographs or documentation as to how and where it was found is not helpful. This can be considered spoliation of evidence and put your chances of subrogation at risk. If ever in doubt, you can always call your forensic experts for guidance and again, the best bet is if items need to be moved, take photos of everything where it is before moving it. Our third do is to get your forensic expert involved as soon as you can. As soon as it's been determined that a forensic expert is needed, get them to the site, get them notified, and get the investigation going. This will help get the scene processed, identify evidence, to secure evidence, and to get it properly examined in a timely manner to prevent any deterioration. Just remember, the more time that evidence is not preserved, it increases the risk of being compromised. Compromised evidence decreases your chance of finding a cause. So make sure that evidence is treated appropriately, make sure it's secured, and make sure it's secured appropriately and quickly. <clears throat> the first don't on our list today is don't delay having an initial discussion with your insured. Here are a few questions that can be asked very quickly it's not a formal interview, it's a discussion and quite possibly the first discussion that you will have with your insured on site or on the day of the event or when you get the assignment. It's designed to elicit some very specific information that will help you and will help the investigator during their examination of the scene. There's only three questions, which take about 15 seconds to ask and probably the conversation should last no longer than two or three minutes. This can be done without taking notes, it can be done in a conversational setting, which puts the insured at ease. And as you're having a conversation, you can ask these questions. What did you see? What did you do? And what did you do next? We have found that these are very good at eliciting specific information. You can use these for the fire service, for the observations of their first responding firefighters, as well as police, as well as any witnesses. Now, they don't seem to be very in-depth questions, but what they do is actually form a specific function. If this fire that you're dealing with is a fire that's accidental, and the information supplied by the homeowner or the insured is going to be very direct as to what they saw and what they did in this event. Let's also consider that this fire may be by design. This may have been the creation of an illusion of an accidental event. If that's the case, in preparation for this fire and the story, this individual has created a story around this event and has rehearsed this story. But as typical, these stories are rehearsed from the beginning to the end. If you ask an open-ended question such as, well, what do you think happened? You're gonna get the story that's been contrived and has been rehearsed from start to finish. These questions are designed to interrupt that process. These questions are designed to go right to the middle of that story, which will do two things. One, it's going to disrupt the thinking pattern of this person who has developed the story. It will create a problem for them to try and fast forward in their mind through the sequence that they're going to try to tell you in order to get to that answer. You're more likely to get an honest answer or one that's closer to the truth than the one that is contrived. So you're just disrupting the potential of somebody not telling me the truth and you're creating a roadblock for them to go ahead and tell you a whole story which has been contrived. Again, if this is somebody who's a legitimate victim of an accidental event, this will help them explain to you in a very brief scenario what happened and you can take that information and pass it on to the investigator. So when you ask, what did you see? You're asking them what they saw and whether they knew what was going on and what they had to deal with. When you ask, what did you do? This will go on to tell us if they actually tried to intervene with this fire. 
Did they try and put it out? Did they try and open doors and windows to get the smoke out only to advance the fire spread? This is important information that we could use. And when you ask what did you do next, you can get any additional bits of information that they may have done, any secondary acts they may have done before the emergency was completed. So think of these questions. These can be done as a conversation. Once you take out a pen and paper, people, people start to realize that this is going to be important and they may be very guarded with their answers. But if it's free flowing conversation, you're more likely to get a very relaxed and easier to understand response. Our next don't is to don't alter the fire scene. As you can see in this photograph, this is a fire in a closet. By the time our investigator arrived on site, this area was completely cleaned out. As, as you can see, not only is the section of the floor gone, but all the debris is gone, which means that the fuel for this fire is gone. More importantly, the ignition source for this fire is gone. Leave the, see, leave the fire scene as is. Don't clean it up. Let us see it as it was found at the conclusion of the event. Let us evaluate all the evidence and the information from that scene. The next don't on our list <clears throat> is to not send us information that is based on opinion. The information that we need with regard to your loss is the location of the fire and the type of the fire, such as this is a bedroom fire or kitchen fire or garage fire. That's the type of information that we need. This will allow us to get the right expert to you as quickly as possible to get your loss investigated so you can get this loss advanced. We need to treat every file as if it's going to end up in litigation. By you putting your opinion or someone else's opinion on that notice of loss, that could end up being part of the file and could it end up being discoverable. So it's important to just give, the, give us the basic information that we need to do our job and treat every file as if it's going to end up in litigation. Don't put anything in writing that you don't want a judge reading. Now to recap, security of the scene, leaving the scene unaltered and making sure that the scene is secure and tight before we can get there is very important. Don't bias your investigation prior to us getting there and make sure that when we do secure equipment and secure evidence that it's stored properly so it can be examined properly. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about automotive losses and some of the unique features of vehicle fires and their interaction and combination with structure fires. Again, as kind of an extension of what was said earlier, securing the scene for a vehicle fire includes the vehicle and its surroundings. Don't move anything or rearrange anything. Just leave the site and scene as is and take photos of everything in, in the envelope surrounding the vehicle. Here's one that was taken care of properly. It was fenced off. You can see there's even some additional information in the surrounding area, including the vehicles in the driveway, which shows level of fire damage, wind direction, all those subtle bits of pieces of information that help us put things together. For example, a vehicle in a garage should be sealed off and don't let work crews into this area. If it's outdoors, don't move it if possible. Leave it as is and contact an expert ASAP. If it's outdoors and needs to be moved, instruct first responders or contractors to take as many photos and videos of the lost location and the event. If it's indoors, secure the room or the garage as one large fire scene. Treat the entire area as extremely valuable evidence. Items surrounding the vehicle, such as extension cords or block heaters, form a part of that fire scene. These need to be left in their original position, and not simply collected and put in a garbage bag. Again, don't move anything around, leave it as is. One of the big issues with uh, vehicle fires in a garage is, did the fire start in the vehicle or did the fire start in the garage? Which is the initiation site and which is the result of the fire spread? All of that information is still available. It's all in there. Resist the urge to drag the, the vehicle out of the garage and examine it in the driveway. Just leave it where it is. It has to be excavated, but leave it where it is so that all that information remains available. In this instance, after the fire scene gets dug out, and again, that's the big question is whether it was a result of the building or whether it's a result of the vehicle. In this instance, it's actually neither. It was an extension cord that was used on one of the tools that was being used for the restoration of this vehicle. So if this vehicle gets dragged out and all that information goes out with it, 
and that opportunity to understand the actual cause and ignition mechanism is lost. Now, a vehicle could basically be defined as anything with wheels on it. Therefore, a fire scene or loss location could really be anywhere. It's not limited to just an enclosure or a building. This particular tractor is shown at the loss location, and there's an enormous amount of value and information that's available there. Often we get photographs or short videos from cell phones, and people say to us that they're kind of shaky, they're not very good, but we do ask for them anyways. What that gives us is a whole bunch of information environmentally specific information. So if we see that smoke is going straight up, we can tell there's not much wind uh, influencing the fire patterns and consumption. It also gives us a relative position of the glow or where the fire initiates. Even if they catch it in its later stages, it gives us an opportunity to backstep and recreate a fire timeline, at least to the point of discovery. As you can see, the opposite side of this tractor tells an entirely different tale. The tires are consumed much more so in the center portion between the two axles. Again, this is at the loss location. If this tractor was flat bedded and rolled out of here, those tires would have been rotated and all that information would have been lost. All this positional information is valuable in terms of the fire patterns and fire damage because the fuel load in vehicles is a little bit different, not the same as in structure fires. Also, you have a bunch of information that's available in this photograph showing the consumption of the operator cab and again, this general fire pattern where we can follow this back to an area of origin. One of the other unique properties of this particular loss location is since it's at the loss location, we get the fire patterns and the heat damage to the crop on the field. That tells us exactly what way the wind is blowing at this location. We're not relying on general Environment Canada data. We know exactly where the wind is blowing at the time of the fire at this location. We also get an indication of how strong it's blowing and we can backstep that through the timeline and through the fire patterns and consumption and get back to an area of origin. And how this fire has progressed from that area of origin moves through all the combustible materials. We realize that because vehicles are mobile, they don't always get examined at the last location, but when it's possible, it can gain us valuable information. We do have a printable background information checklist that's available that references a lot of the background information that is extremely useful to an investigation. Um, if anyone's interested, there will be a survey question at the end of the presentation. Just select that you would like to receive it and we'll send it out to you. Again, if there's any photographs that are available by cell phone or video taken at the lost location or shortly after discovery, they become incredibly valuable. Some of the unique product properties of vehicles is they're not necessarily stationary at a loss location. Different conditions represent different status of circuits and the subsystems that form these vehicles. That all provides additional information that we can extract and step back in time to recreate the fire timeline and get back to actually what happened. Also, beware of spoliation of evidence. Don't eliminate the possibility of other parties' involvements. This is especially particular or widespread when it comes to vehicles. The, the definition of vehicles is a very broad umbrella definition. Anything from go-karts to buses to heavy equipment. It's entirely possible that a vehicle, especially a transport truck, will be made up of multiple assemblies from different manufacturers and different people's involvement. This includes chassis manufacturer, an engine manufacturer, which may or may not necessarily be the chassis manufacturer. They may be married together with common wiring. An outfit manufacturer or bodybuilder, if there's any cargo areas on it, or if there are snow plows or additional, additional equipment on it. Any added equipment, such as radios or GPS logging equipment. And then some fleets, depending on how they finance things, may have a distributor or leasing company. Again, depending on the size of the fleet or depending on the size of the operation, they may do some of the maintenance in-house and they may farm some of that maintenance out to other shops, depending on how busy they are or whatever their shop policies are. And then on top of that, you've got the end user. In the case of transport trucks, you may also have a trailer and the contents load in that trailer. And if that just happens to be backed up towards a building, now you've got eight or nine parties that are potentially involved in a loss.
So yeah, you just want to be aware of spoliation of evidence and don't eliminate the possibility of other parties' involvement. It's entirely possible that you'll start working through and examining the site or the contents and the items, and you may get to a junction where the standards are very clear that you will require a multi-party examination. Once you get to that junction where it's possible that somebody else is involved, you have to stop, preserve the evidence, secure that evidence, and invite the other parties to attend. This is a multi-party examination in a in a bus or for a bus that was in a depot. You can see the incident bus in the background. There's a lot of hands that go into putting together a vehicle of this nature and complexity. At this examination, there were approximately 20 people that signed in on the attendee list. Everyone had to go through things together, carefully and meticulously investigating the cause of the loss. Here's another example of a file that we we're involved in. When we talk about boarding up the lost locations, this is not the intention. This is a vehicle with about 12, or this is a building with about 12 vehicles in it. And all that was left when we were retained was this shed built around one of those vehicles. Here's a view from the opposite side showing the footprint of the original building. And you can imagine how much information is missing. That was contained in all of those vehicles, all the building wiring and bits and pieces of components that are simply just not there. There isn't a complete picture. It's missing an entire section of elements. Now I just want to go through a few hypothetical situations and some of the questions that you might want to ask yourself if you're presented with something similar. So your insured wants their preferred contractor to complete some restoration work after a loss. Things you'll want to consider, is this contractor on board with the restoration plan? Has there been adequate communication between the appropriate parties? Is the plan on budget? Does this contractor have experience with fire or water losses? Do they have adequate licenses and or insurance? Or what about if your insured wants to alter the fire scene after a fire or water loss to make the property more suitable for living? Some things that you might want to consider, what areas can be altered without risking evidence spoliation? Can the insured be escorted safely within the property to re retrieve belongings? What items need to be seized or documented prior to them altering the scene? Can you change the examination date so it can be completed prior to the alterations being completed? Or if you have received a vehicle fire claim where the vehicle has already been towed to a yard, which is unsecured, some things you'll want to consider. Has the vehicle been tarped? If not, ask if it can be. Was any vehicle found around the vehicle, or was any debris found around the vehicle swept into the cab or truck bed? Is the vehicle currently incurring storage fees? If so, see if it can be moved to a lot where you have a contract in place. Does the tow truck driver have any pertinent information that you should know? What if the evidence that needs to be seized for a fire or water loss cannot be seized immediately due to its size, weight, or location? Some things you want to consider, can components be seized without risk of spoliation? Can the investigator document and prepare the evidence to be moved before getting the restoration contractor to move and store it? Is the evidence secure if it's left unattended until it can be seized? If the evidence is moved and stored elsewhere, is it secure? Now, I guess it's question time. Thank you all for, for listening. Hey, thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, we've got a couple questions uh, and we'll see if anything else rolls in while we, uh, while we field these. Uh, so, uh, first one, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of waiting for a follow up on this. Uh, it was just, uh, what car is that? And I assumed uh, that he's talking about the one in the garage uh, around slide 28. Yeah, Which... I'm not sure of the year, but it looks like a Challenger to me. It's pretty nice. 
Uh, okay, so uh, related, uh, how do you examine a vehicle that has been moved? Um, ideally, obviously, we want to get back, we want to take a look at that lost location, um, but the reality is a lot of times they're moved. Um, if you can take pictures of the lost location or from the incident, that's extremely valuable. But uh, it's like you, you want to try to find out where that vehicle was so you can look at that location because um, you want to get as much information as you can from that. But again, it's going to be background information and observations from the operator. What did they see? What did they do? What did they do next? Sometimes it's it's moved and there's not nothing you can do. That lost location is gone. So you just have to, to work with what you have left. Yeah, that's great. Um, so uh, yeah, related back to, I think we're looking at uh, our sort of our structure fires. Uh, is it better to have security guards? Uh, sorry, is having security guards better than boarding up a house? Um, it's kind of uh, really a six of one, half a dozen of the other. They both have their pros and cons for sure. Uh, it's obviously going to be much cheaper to just board up a house uh, than to hire security. But if it's just boarded up, it, it can still technically be broken into. Um, people can remove those boards and gain access. Um, security will alleviate that, but it is going to cost a bit of money. It is nice to have security, then you don't have to board up the building. It allows it to off gas a bit better and a bit easier. So the scene is a little bit easier to, to be in. It also, is, it's nice having that uh, natural light while you're in there. But I guess you can just take the boards off as well once you're once you're examining the scene. So yeah, there's no real definitive answer to that. Uh, they're both good. Uh, it just kind of depends on the circumstances. And again, like that's just something you can always talk to your forensic expert, give them a shout, see what they think. If it's uh, a very suspicious fire, you might want to get security. Okay, great. Uh, so I mean, we covered this a little bit at the beginning. Maybe. I mean, there's something else you can think of. Uh, what are a couple or key directions to give a contractor before they go out and potentially desert, disturb evidence at a site? Yeah, like that's the that's the stuff we really we covered at the start, kind of. But uh, yeah, you just want to make sure that they don't alter the scene, um, or they alter it as little as possible. Um, at least if you have to move something, if it's unsafe or if something is if something is say outside or getting risk or a risk of being compromised, take photos of it before you, before you have to move it. Yeah, and then we're back to yeah, preserve the electrical panel. Yeah. Your debris up and board up the scene. Okay. Um how do you deal with authorities? Um how do you deal with authorities that are already on site? Like I'm assuming you're talking um, police and fire. Uh, we usually work quite well with those uh, with those individuals. Um, usually have uh, worked with them in the past, and it's obviously their jurisdiction. It's their their incident until they they hand it over. But we've never really had any issues. We work hand in hand with them. A little more of a general question here. Um, might be tricky to answer. Are you seeing more fires caused by cheaper imported items like items from Amazon? That's a yeah. That that's definitely a, a possibility. Not necessarily from Amazon, but anything that's uh, maybe not CSA approved or it, it hasn't been uh, thoroughly tested with our power grid or with our, I guess, uh, standards. So yeah. You always have to make sure, and, and actually, even stuff that says it's CSA approved, if there is um, counterfeit versions of those, you can get the little stickers that people will make counterfeit versions and and stick those on. So you have to be really careful. Make sure you buy it from a reputable source. And I think Amazon, you'd probably be all right. I can't say for sure, but uh, some other um, like the dollar store, I know that they sell um, extension cords and stuff that. Uh, that have been known to fail. Yeah, you just have to be really careful with what you buy, I guess. 
Uh, okay. Um, why would you? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Why would you allow alterations on, to the site before you've completed your investigation? I guess the only real um, time that would occur would be for safety reasons. Um, you can do alterations in an area, like if it's a small kitchen fire and they're doing something in the living room that might not affect the scene. So that would be probably fine, but you don't, you, you just, you do want to keep traffic to a minimum in those locations and, and really, yeah, it would be extenuating circumstances, I guess, that you would actually do any sort of alterations. Okay. Usually uh, safety involved. I mean, just, uh, yeah, sorry, there's, there's a lot coming in here. I'm, I'm just trying to read them uh, before I uh, go into one. So it's basically best before anything else happens after a loss, once the police and fire release the scene, to have you be the next one to go in. So no one else until you've completed your investigation, correct? Yes, that's definitely correct. And if there is other people that have entered the scene, you're, you're going to want a record of that because you're going to want to talk to them. But the best bet is to, to have us, the forensic experts, or, um, to be the next people to enter that scene. Great. What are the, the key questions that are typically missed by an adjuster when you assess a file for investigation? I guess really the most important ones that we really need is the the type of loss that it was and the contact information for the insured um like we kind of went through what did you see what did you do that's really the only information that we really want to know we want to go to that scene without having too much information about opinions of what happened so that we can form our own investigation and opinions and it'll uh it just works a lot better that way um in rural areas excavators are asked to demo the building what can be done to prevent this from happening um sorry can you repeat that i'm not yeah. sure if I... yeah uh in rural areas excavators are asked to demo the building what can be done to prevent this from happening so I, i'm guessing you know before an investor has a chance to attend the scene uh they're demoing the building is, is there anything that can be done to prevent that Oh, I see. Um, sometimes it's necessary, like I, the only time I can really think it would be necessary would be safety reasons again, or for fire suppression. Sometimes they have to actually tear, if it's like a, if it's got a tin um, exterior on it and they can't get water onto the fire, sometimes they'll have to pull sections down so they can suppress the fire appropriately. So that will need to be done. Like you, you want to get that you want to get water on the fire and you want to get that fire out and preserve as much of that scene as you can. So sometimes that is necessary. Um, I've had other ones where like a large hotel or something like that might go down three, four stories. And then if they're old, they might have a brick chimney that's still standing. So that makes that scene fairly unsafe. You want to get that down because you don't want it falling on you, obviously. Makes but sense. you could easily work with people and, and let them know, like, is there a specific reason that you need to take this building down? And if you agree with the reason, then, then that should be fine. But uh, it, again, if you're not sure, contact your forensic expert and you can discuss at a case by case basis. Okay. Um, is there a checklist available similar to the audio, similar to the auto one previously shown for property buyers? Uh, and I'll go ahead and if you don't mind, I'll answer. I don't, I don't think we have one ready, but that's a great idea. We should. Yep. We could do that. Yeah. 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 You can send us an email or, uh, or, or just, uh, yeah, send us an email, I guess. And we can, uh, we can, we can work on one of those for you for sure. Yeah. I'll make note of that. Yeah. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah. We don't have authorization to hire an engineer and have to wait for the insurer to decide. To, the travel trailer fire is outside and exposed to elements. What is the best idea to protect the evidence? Use a tarp and leave electrical cables, plug an electrical box on the ground, 
or photograph and collect it. So that was, that was, that was a, lot, it was a long one. Yeah, it would probably be a really, you'd have to determine it by case by case, but I think about if you tarp that up, that should be, that would be fine. That would be great. We've definitely gone to them where they're not tarped as well. And if they are tarped and it preserves the scene quite a bit better. Um, yeah, you do want to make sure it's not plugged in. You don't want to risk having it uh, catch again, but uh, especially if it was something electrical related. And if worse comes to worse, if, if all you can really do is photograph it uh, as best as possible, that's always, you know, I would say even do that before you tarp it. It doesn't hurt to have a few extra photos and we'll still want to preserve the scene as best you can. Good point. Okay, uh, anything else? And if um, anyone has any questions that are further too, if they, if they can't think of them right now, you can always send us an email and we can, we'll get back to you for sure. Yeah, actually, yeah, do you want to go to the next slide, Ryan? I think your contact information's up there. Um, so yeah, and, and feel free to contact Ryan. It's rnorton at origin-and-cause.com. Um, and again, at the end of the webinar, you're going to get a survey. Uh, you're going to be asked about the, the auto background information checklist. You're going to be asked about the national tour. And uh, you'll also have an opportunity if uh, if a question does kind of suddenly pop in your mind, you can just you can put it there if you like. Um, so I know we'd be ending a little bit early today. We can kind of give everyone a little more time to send in questions if they can think of them. But uh, I think oh sorry, one more. Uh, how do you get your info if the scene is a crime scene? <clears throat> well, we would request reports from fire and police, um, but once the scene's released, then we we're, we would be um, fine in going in there and, and working the scene. Um, it would be the same as, as if it was a, a maintenance issue or a, or a mechanical issue. We're going to in interview everybody involved that we can. Uh, we're going to go to the scene and collect our evidence, um, process the scene, and yeah, we'll request uh, the police and fire reports and see if there's any applicable information in there. Um, other than that, it's it's pretty much the same as most as most scenes. Okay, uh, sorry, last one for now, uh, and then we'll let everyone go a little early. Uh, how can I photograph evidence or a scene without moving anything? Uh, if, for example, it's snowing, I can take a photo of the site in the snow, but it's going to be difficult to see anything. Uh, yeah, uh, that does definitely happen. Um, every first snowfall, it it could potentially happen. Uh, you can, you just basically have to do the best you can. Um, if you get a two foot dump of snow, it's probably you probably won't know what's there to photograph anyway. Um, you can use a snowblower. Uh, you try not to use a, a shovel or anything because you can remove evidence. But uh, sometimes that's just a scene that you're left with and. There's not much else you can do. We we all use a snow blower or a, like a leaf blower, I guess, and and blow that off if you can, so you can see underneath, or or shovel it out, I guess, if if it's a like a basement or something like that that you need to shovel out. Still want to process all the debris, but yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, I think that covers it. Thank you everyone very much. We'll, uh, we'll let you a little early and uh, if anyone else comes up with anything, we'll just, uh, we'll email them. Uh, and Ryan, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for a great presentation. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you so much. All right, take okay, care everyone. Have a great day.